All right. So hopefully some more fellows will show up, but for now, uh, welcome to the Multimodality Imaging Conference, and today we're uh, going to be talking about endocarditis. Obviously, in endocarditis, echo is always first. So we don't want to do any other modality before doing echo. But the echo speaker is currently in a case, so hopefully he'll be coming in at the end or maybe rescheduled at another time. So we're going to go beyond echo, but always come back to echo. All right, so as I said, echo is always first in endocarditis, but there are many times where it's not the last modality and we may need to gather more information from other modalities about the extent of endocarditis and the help guide the management. So today I'm tasked to talk about CT and nuclear and we'll touch on MRI. So the first thing in CT, what are we looking at? Uh, we're primarily looking at the valve, but usually these are affected, are well assessed by echocardiography. So we're mostly looking at complications. So it's a simple cases usually do not come to CT. It's more the complicated cases that are actually um, have like abscesses or other complications, mechanical complications that usually come to CT prior to uh, surgery or prior to uh, interventions. So when doing CT, if we want to get technical in these valve cases, most often we use the retrospective gating because we want most often to see the heart, the valves as they are moving in systole and diastole. And that's why these are relatively higher radiation exposure than the other proceed protocols that we use for um, uh, our coronary protocols. So here you see a couple cases where you see a vegetation on the aortic valve. And sometimes we detect, like, so, uh, we often detect complications among these cases. Uh, obviously, if it is usually these patients with simple endocarditis, usually they don't come to CT. So we're always seeing the more complicated cases in the CT lab. Now, as I mentioned, the, we're using retrospective gating. So our temporal resolution on our scanner, for example, is about 60 to 65 millisecond. So a highly mobile lesion, we might detect it. If you are scanning on a lower temporal or a worse temporal resolution system, you may not be able to see the highly mobile vegetation. So you need to know the system that you are using. So there are some systems that are still in the cl in clinical use where the temporal resolution is about 200 to 300 milliseconds or 250 millisecond. If you have a small, highly mobile vegetation, you may not be able to see it because it's moving too fast during the uh, acquisition. Usually big vegetations, we are able to detect them because they're not highly mobile and we are able also, like they, we are able to capture them. So how do you define the role of CT and, and versus T? So it's always like you see something on transthoracic and you want to kind of confirm it or get the extent of what you see on transthoracic. So how will CT fitting in? So it depends on which literature you want to look at, but uh, if you're looking at CT versus TE, obviously if you want to use TE as a gold standard, CT has good assessment of endocarditis with sensitivities in the high 90s specificities more than the 80 in the high 80s if you want to look at it compared to operative findings uh, then it will be a little bit higher now keep in mind again that these are not your regular endocarditis cases these are more complicated cases that come to the ct lab usually and for vegetation uh, size and mobility among those cases that were uh, that had CT usually the overall there is good correlation among these cases so uh, during the days of COVID we kind of like try to do more CT for these cases so just to review some of the things that I mentioned about CT here we have higher spatial resolution than TE 
we're giving obviously a volumetric uh, assessment of the entire um, aortic root and other and uh, structures so we can look for concomitant uh, as a use of uh, concomitant pathologies that may be there I'll show you some couple, some cases that have had some local complications, like some of the things that we usually, the cases that we see where there is like a uh, abscess or pseudoaneurysm or dehiscence of the valves, as you see here. So these are like late complications of endocarditis and may not be well seen on TE if there is a lot of artifacts from the metallic valve. Um, Another uh, area where we can assess anatomically, obviously the flow of blood you can see better on transesophageal echo, which is the fistula between the uh, left between the aorta and left atrium. So sometimes these are like potential complications that you get from endocarditis and the anatomical delineation of the especially before surgery are better assessed by CT. Now, how, a bigger question that always comes, is this a panis or thrombus or vegetation? I don't think that we have like really clear cut because there's a lot of overlap, obviously, especially with vegetation and thrombus. But with we, in CT, we use what we call Hounsfield unit in general to kind of help guide us there. So Hounsfield units, like for those of you who have not done CT is like, where we're trying to look at the attenuation of the tissue on uh, CT and uh, each tissue, this is the way that CT does uh, tissue characterization. So by definition, water is zero. So everything is either below water or above water. So things that are below water, usually fat, which is in the negative 50 to 100. If you draw your ROI or region of interest over the lungs, you get like minus 800 to 1,000. Now, once we move like other tissues, now we try to look for potentially thrombus or panis. And there have been some suggestions that you might be able to. In my clinical experience, it is helpful, but again, there is always a big overlap between these two. So it's been suggested that panis is above 140 because of the four fibrous tissue and thrombus is less than 90. But again, keep in mind that these also could be um, overlapping sometimes. Bioprosthetic valves, we're getting more and more of these to be assessed in CT. And again, you need the first thing for fellows, if you're asked to protocol these, especially for degeneration, try to get a non-contrast study because you need to get the non-contrast to see the calcium for degenerative changes. And then we can also with retrospective gating look at the valve leaflets, look at calcifications and potentially look whether there is a thrombus vegetation or panis. Obviously the more closer to thrombus you cannot really tell if it is infected or not but a uh, vegetation would be closer to the thrombus in terms of household unit. Again, looking at complications, you can look for dehiscence of the valves. This is one case we had, uh, I think last year, where the valve is like completely dehisced on one side. And again, in the lack, in the absence of gold standard, the how can you potentially, like, where do I use CT versus TE? And this is a study that looked at 75 patients who had both tests, so hopefully little selection bias. But obviously someone who required both tests will be having more, like, advanced disease. And when you're looking at those who had, if you look at TE negative and CT positive in terms of vegetation, it's none. So TEE, for, if you're looking for the vegetation itself, you're best detecting it by transesophageal echo. Now where CT has the edges, mostly looking at the intracardiac or potentially surrounding tissue complications. So you can see perivalvular abscess, uh, valve perforation sometimes, and fistulas is where TE, where CT may have uh, an edge compared to uh, T.
Now, one additional area now that we are starting to see is also to look after, after TAVR. This is one of my patients actually who had a uh, TAVR and uh, after TAVR everything looked good. She went home, became back febrile with shortness of breath and her gradients were gone up. And we couldn't do a TE initially, but you can see here that the whole valve is full of vegetation. And unfortunately, she didn't make it with this valve endocarditis, especially in the early days of TAVR, where those patients that were selected into TAVR are the ones that were deemed surgically uh, inoperable. Uh, again, keep in mind that with CT, we can look at the extra cardiac complications, obviously not in the brain. They're not, it's not usually in our field of view, but at least for cardiologists, the spleen often is in our field of view. So you can look for splenic infarcts, can also look for renal infarcts. At least we see usually the upper pole and you can also look at aortic aneurysms. So this is very helpful for CT to look at evidence of embolization and obviously in the um, cases of right-sided endocarditis you can look for pulmonary septic emboli in the lungs and uh, what we see for um, aortic valve obviously if there is a highly mobile lesion and there is a need for coronary assessment CT is one of those is a technique that's going to be very helpful here and it has very good uh, accuracy especially it's, it's been studied in this population and this is a list of the studies that at least until 2016 that looked at perioperative CT, uh, CT for perioperative coronary assessment and in general the sensitivity is pretty high is about 93 percent specificity is 89 percent Again, for these cases, sometimes it is going to be, especially those who have aortic valve and if they have open AI, they are tachycardic. So you may require to use a higher radiation protocol and gather multiple phases, retrospective gating, to be able to get a good view of the coronaries in these cases. And if you have two systems, one would you choose the better the system with the better temporal resolution to allow you to be able to see coronaries. If the heart rate is in the 110 and 120, we've done it, and sometimes it's like a hit and miss. Most often you're able to clear it, but there are times where if the patient is having open AI and you cannot really control lower their heart rate because they're going to be dependent on uh, the heart rate for their cardiac output, then it may be a little bit challenging for these. Uh, just a few words about MRI. Usually these patients are seen in MRI if it is more of a complication of endocarditis, so if they have valvular regurgitation and others. I know Dr. Shah and others have covered this topic uh, a lot, so I'm not going to take much time on that. But uh, MRI is great in assessment of regurgitant lesions that are usually associated with endocarditis. So more on the subacute phase and longer term remodeling and complications more related to the valves. Um, and here you can also see some uh, regurgitations that can be seen here. Again, similar to CT with MRI, if it is a very small, highly mobile vegetation, you may not be able to detect it well. A larger vegetation or obviously another complication, you may be able to see it well. So switching gears to uh, the role of PET, and this is a, an area where um, it was probably not very much done and still not very much done in the United States. In Europe, it's becoming like almost like ECHO and PET is going to be is the main tool that they use and therefore assessment of endocarditis. And mostly of the, the studies that have been published about this come from Europe. And here you can see very uh, intense FTG uptake around these prosthetic valves. So you can see uh, it's not homogeneous, but there is very intense uptake, which is signaling usually endocarditis in the proper setting. Again, FTG is not uh, going to give you a tissue uh, diagnosis. It's not going to tell you whether it's... Uh, and we'll go through some of the challenges of PET imaging in these cases.
So usually if it is the aortic valve or mitral valve, we try to give them uh, the uh, diet. We prepare them with diet to be able to assess the aortic valve and mitral valve because we don't want any myocardial uptake uh, of the uh, FTG that we're giving. So usually the way we do it is that we ask them to have a low fat diet, low carbohydrate diet the day before, and then we follow it up by uh, fasting for prolonged uh, duration, and then we image them after we inject FTG. We try to give them heparin uh, if there is no contraindication to heparin in these cases. This is primarily we're using it for aortic valve and mitral valve because of close proximity to the myocardium. And this is where you can see here if the effect of cardiac preparation. So you see on top somebody who is well prepared, the myocardium does not pick up any uh, FTG and on the lower you see a lot of myocardial uptake which make it very difficult really to look at the aortic and mitral valve in these cases. Now th there are some patterns that can be seen in endocarditis using um, FTG PET. The most important thing is that it cannot be homogeneous and has to be because endocarditis is very focal it's not the entire ring even if it is uh, the entire ring is infected, there would be some heterogeneity in the amount of bacteria or inflammation around the ring. So homogeneous uptake is kind of usually concerning for us for false positive, but if you see it like here, more um, you see um, diffuse uptake all over, but there is more intense uptake around here, then it's very focal. This pattern is extremely concerning. Usually it's very focal for an abscess there. So we look at the pattern as well as the location of the uptake for these patients. Uh, sometimes uh, we recently had a case where there was even the aorta post-surgical and the patient had the entire ascending aorta where it was infected, the graft uh, infected. And that's why these patients uh, like uh, not only looking at the infection around the valve, but also looking at the c potential complication with these. Um, this is one of our cases where you see on CT where we saw like potential abscess there, but when doing FTG, there's clearly very intense focal FTG uptake. Uh, this patient actually had no vegetation on echocardiography, so it was primarily the string and the, probably by the time of imaging, the vegetation have embolized somewhere uh, in this patient. And here you can look at it in different views and see, uh, and this case was actually confirmed by pathology from the surgery and the uh, culture. You can also look for TAVR valves. So this is like not um, limited to surgical valves. So you can look at TAVR valves and endocarditis, and you can clearly see here, this is a case actually from the European Heart Journal where there is an infection in the TAVR valve, not even at the annular level, but even more distal uh, in the level, at the level of the ascending aorta. So what are the limitations of PET? And this is one common question I always get, which is like the first thing is that the sensitivity in native valves is very low. So native valves, like if we see it, great, then it's endocarditis, but if we don't see it, that doesn't mean a whole lot. So something to keep in mind, I've been asked to do some cases where there was a high suspicion of uh, infection on a native valve if and this is something to keep in mind if you just want to confirm it you see something and you don't know what it is and you want to see if it is a endocarditis or not if you see if it uptake great you make your diagnosis lack of uptake doesn't help you so you can see here there is no uptake on the aortic valve not on the uh, fuse images and not on the pet images and you can see this large vegetation sitting on the aortic valve. So clearly we are not able to see this native valve endocarditis. So something to keep in mind, that's the first limitation. Additional limitations is that uh, 
as we go with time, we need to kind of calibrate our eyes to what is normal physiologic uptake around the valve, especially among these surg post-surgical changes. So there is still a false positive rate. Uh, I think uh, the extremes of cases are going to be not false positive, but usually if it is mild diffuse uptake, this is where we can potentially get some of the complications. So I'll show you here like one case where there is this mild, diffuse, very full ring kind of uptake. This is, I would say, could be related to the surgical glue that you see here. So one of the things that surgeons use is surgical glue for reasons I'm not very familiar with. They do uptake FTG. So any post-surgical changes, we see it with alvas, we see it with aortic valves and others. So post-surgical glue does take um, FTG. The other thing that always comes to us, like, are you sure this is not inflammation? Because especially in early after surgery, there will be some inflammatory changes. So if you see a case like this where there is very focal intense uptake, it's extremely unlikely to be inflammation. This is infection. This is very concerning for infection because it's very focal, intense. While if you go and look at other areas, for example, here this is a case where they described inflammation and this is a patient who was allergic to surgical glue and apparently had uh, external wound, uh, like a lot of inflammation there, and you can see all this uptake. So this case turned out to be, uh, I haven't seen such a case in clinical practice. This is actually from someone who published a lot about this uh, in Europe and in the Netherlands. So these are some cases where you have to be very careful. Obviously, you won't be able to know for sure until you draw cultures, because this could be also uh, like you have to rule out like external wound infection at least. So again, this pattern, focal, heterogeneous, intense is what we are looking for to be sure of endocarditis. This pattern is we are sure it's inflammation. Anything in between is like sometimes may you have to look at the overall picture. You may need to repeat to look at additional imaging. You may need it's like more of a gray, kind of more of a grayish zone. But uh, like this is one of our cases here where you see very diffuse uptake. SUVs were only four, which is low relatively for this. And this was like more related to the surgical glue at the site of the valve. Um, another area where we are seeing, like, we have to look, when you are reading these studies, you have to get, like, more of a consult. So sometimes we get cases transferred to us, like, after two weeks of antibiotics at a different facility. And now there is still something on the aortic valve, and they want to know if it's endocarditis. Two weeks of antibiotic will lower our sensitivity, because many of these will become sterile and so one thing to keep in mind that if there is any uptake in these cases that have had antibiotics, we usually should alert the referring physicians about that. So again, to look at the accuracy given all these technical limitations for native valve, it is only 31%, so, but it is pretty specific. So if you see it, you're sure. For prosthetic valves, it's in the high 80s, high, mid to high 80s, and it is very helpful uh, for prosthetic valves. Now, like CT, you can also look for uh, complications and uptake outside the, um, like, uh, the heart. So you can see here, for example, if there is uh, extra cardiac findings, usually like osteomyelitis, we can also look for discitis and uh, other uptake, usually also on the right side. If there is right-sided endocarditis, we can look also for uptake in the uh, lungs. Um, for sites that do not do PET, there is another technique which probably used a lot in residency, which is the WBC scan. Uh, so WB scan uh, is a little bit more specific, but less sensitive. And this is a case actually from the literature where by FTG PET, 
you see heterogeneous uptake around the aortic valve, but there was no uptake on the YWB scan. So white blood cell scan is also a good tool for infection. However, it has a little bit less sensitivity, but also, again, some s higher specificity. So again, we do not just do it for uh, valves. We can look beyond valves, and this is where probably it's gaining a lot of traction. So we can look at v pacemakers, and we've done few cases where, again, if you see heterogeneous uptake around the pacemaker, especially around the pocket or the leads, then it is very concerning usually for endocarditis. So you can see here, again, heterogeneous uptake around the valve. Now, keeping in mind, whenever I see something around the valve, I ask, when was the device put in? Because within the first three months, you might get some inflammatory changes, especially if it was not a complete device. It was like just lead revision or a generator change. So very important to know if whenever you're scanning a valve, uh, sorry, uh, scanning a pacemaker or ICD, to know when was that device put in. If it's longer, then it is, uh, should be real and uh, looked at. So again, for devices, the sensitivity is about 72%, specificity is in 83%. And this is a meta-analysis of multiple studies. It can be uh, like, there are some tools that we utilize which can enhance the accuracy on these devices, including uh, utilizing uh, like better CT technology to kind of limit the artifacts that we get there. And finally, we're getting a lot of assessment of ALVAD infections, and this is where probably there is no single modality that's able to give you a good answer for these patients especially to remind you that the sites of infection can be at four sites. So it can be in the drive line, it can be at the pump, the inflow cannula, and outflow cannula. Obviously, the newer heart-made devices, the HeartMate 3 doesn't have an inflow. It's like more attached than the, to the uh, LV apex. So we can detect infections at all of them, but again, it's very important to know that there are also some post-surgical changes that you see, a lot of surgical glue. So we usually kind of raise our bar in terms of intensity of uptake among these. So here you see, for example, a patient who has significant driveline infection. So you can see here that we can detect it. And this is kind of the easiest. And this is what the heart failure team always hope, that it's only limited to driveline and it's not going beyond the driveline. Unfortunately, there are many times where you can see it like more related to the outflow track or like for example, this is one of our cases where it's very intense in the outflow track. And you can also see here like another case of driveline infection. And this is a case where there is even infection at the pump itself. So these are like uh, sometimes very difficult to treat and unfortunately we've lost few patients to these repeated infections that usually the only treatment after antibiotic therapy is really to explant but some of these patients have one explant and one revision after another and eventually there's limit to what you can do. And there is data to look at if there is a central infection then, so once a pump is infected, and then it becomes very difficult, and it's almost like survival rate is less than 25% in these patients. So what is it in the guidelines? Uh, in Europe, as I mentioned, the PET-CT has been kind of very well uh, included in their clinical practice, as well as in uh, their guidelines. And this is their most recent one, the 21, uh, 2021, where it says that if you have possible endocarditis by the modified Duke, obviously you're just going to start with echo. And if it's possible endocarditis, then FTG PET CT may be helping you in these patients. Uh, the U.S. is still lagging behind the most recent version in the valvular guidelines is when it first showed up, actually.
And this is a copy paste from the VAVA guidelines, which came out like a couple years ago, showing that, again, the use of FTG PET CT really to assess uh, suspected pro prosthetic valve endocarditis increased the diagnostic capability. But again, the lack of limited randomized data, there have been some multi-center registries that looked at it and um, it's pretty much helpful in terms of increasing the overall diagnosis and reclassifying the uh, patients. And uh, this is uh, fusing it again, if you have possible endocarditis, then FTG PET is gonna help you if uh, CT, obviously if you do CT with contrast, that's also going to be helpful at least for localization and identifying uh, complications as we mentioned in the beginning. With this, I'm going to stop and any questions? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, so in terms of diagnosis, I understand the limitations. Is there any application for guiding therapy? I mean, you can follow it up after treatment. The problem is that these changes are going to take time. So it's like, unless like we see it only for follow up in LVAD patients, especially if they are on lifetime suppressive therapy. But if you're talking about like doing endocarditis and repeating like you do with TE, probably it's going to lag behind the uptake. So we usually don't do it as follow up. The only time that we do follow-ups are uh, primarily the LVAT patients. Any other question? Just trying to think of how can how can we help um, differentiate inflammation post implantation from infection? And are they are there any trials? or at least registries for some patients maybe a month or two after a surgery. So at least we know uh, what uh, the signal is like. I have the slide, but I hid it. Uh, so usually it's like uh, inflammation is about in the first three months. So anything above beyond three months, it's extremely unlikely to be inflammation. And inflammation is more in the pattern uh, inflammation is more like pretty much homogeneous and lower SUVs. So once you get very intense focal, I mean some like folks like the guy, Dr. Schultens from Netherlands, he believes like even you should do it even early. If you find homogeneous uptake, you say it's negative, but if it is like endocarditis, it's going to be focal and intense. So even in the early postoperative period, it's more related to the pattern. So if it is focal, like all the endocarditis cases we diagnose, SUVs are above 10. I mean, 10 and above, unless they are like on some antibiotic therapy for like a week or two. But the endocarditis cases are not going to be equivocal. Usually they, like once, unless they are on antibiotics, they are pretty intense and very focal and you'll be able to make the diagnosis. Uh, inflammation is homogeneous, mild, very homogeneous. So that's why, and usually the whole controversy is for the first three months post-surgical, any procedure like device implantation or the pocket revision, uh, so it's primarily for that very first period. One question. Is, is there an understanding of why the surgery was not It's not well understood. I mean, uh, usually it could be just the type of fibrin material that you have around that metallic. It has to have some metal in there. So even bioprosthetic valves, you still detect it from the mitra, like from the valve ring that is there. So it has to have some metal in it. If there is no metal, and probably that relates to the, like how bacteria or the microbiology at that level and how intense is the fibrin material and the infection there. But again... Well, even the mobility, you know, once you have metal, since it is affecting the metal, in a native valve, 
Yeah, but yeah, but in native valve, once you get to the like, let's say abscess, and then your accuracy goes up. So it's like if vegetation itself you may not detect, but but abscesses and others you still detect in native valves. But like most often what we get, or oh, we saw something on echo, it's a five millimeter flickering on the aortic valve, can you do to tell us if it's infected or not? That one is not, I cannot help it. I mean, and most often when I was pushed to do it, it turned out to be nothing. I mean, at least we didn't see it, and then I put in the report. The lack of FDG uptake does not rule out endocarditis. So, but uh, yeah, again, uh, for native valves, once they get to the level of complications, like perforation or big abscess, or uh, then usually we see uptake. I mean, I think the case I showed you was a native valve initially. Let me see if I... So... No, actually it was metallic, yeah. But I mean, if there is an abscess, usually you do see uptake in there. So let's get a, some recommendations for this crowd. Um, prosthetic valves, I mean, native valves, I think echo T is your, and, and surface echo is not as bad, right? So it's yeah. a beautiful. Uh, if you have a prosthetic valve, you know what your sensitivity is by TE. What is it? TE or TE? TE. TE. Probably 80. That means 5, 80%. So but it depends the on what you are looking for. If exactly. you're looking at the valve itself versus the compl local complications. No, we're, we're just thinking out loud of where do we use PET in this situation. If I have a vegetation and patient is infected, whichever way, we don't need to go anywhere. If you have suspicion of an endocarditis and you're not seeing anything impressive, on a prosthetic valve bypass is of a geo echo. I think that could be an yeah. indication. Especially metallic ones that echo could struggle with from reverberation artifacts and others. And the other is differentiating conceivably a thrombus on a pacemaker from an infection. You know, Tom, you see things on a pacemaker. Use <coughs> <coughs> your clinical judgment, and at this one, conceivably. And the biggest hardware, obviously, if you have a bad, you know, transesophageal is a tough one. So let me ask you, let me pr push it a little bit. Would you refine your algorithm a little bit based on which valve location, aortic versus mitral, <coughs> and based on whether it's bioprosthetic versus metallic Do you think that the sensitivity for TE is similar? Across all four of those, where there's some variability, where some it's more sensitive than some is less. Hard to tell, but experience tells us that they're not equivalent. Because number one, you have to take a look at imaging, whether imaging is accurate enough, yes or no. Uh, oh, I'm not sure what you found. <laughs> <laughs> Very good because you see on fast the whole right picture. Aortic is a little tougher. If you have two cross pieces, it gets even tougher because you have shadowing by TE from the mitral from the mitral to the aortic, right? So it becomes it becomes problematic. So number one is you have to be cognizant in your reporting 
as to what you see in confidence versus what you don't see in confidence, so that you, that you don't mislead the clinician. Bioprosthetics are probably a little easier than, than a mechanical valve to assess because usually you see the struts, you see the, you know, the valve itself, and uh, so tricuspid are even more difficult to very Pulmonic are probably better seen transthoracically as opposed to TE. And so best visualization is mitral, aortic, tricuspid, pulmonic, TE-wise. Do you agree? Yeah. I mean, for CT, is like we see most often the primary indication is to look for potential complications. And many of these patients are sick, so CT is kind of a quick test to gather information about mechanical complications. Obviously, it doesn't give you physiologic information, which is usually obtained from echocardiography, like if there is a fistula. But it's very good to anatomically assess a fistula, and usually it's very helpful for surgical pre-planning. And most often, they need the coronaries, like it comes as a full package before surgical correction. I think PET, where it adds on top of CT is primarily if you see something and you're not sure if it's an infection or something else on these, on the valves, this is where it adds. I think for assessment of leads, pacemakers, and also LVADs, this is where it's probably more of a niche for PET. I mean, CT is going to be helpful too, but you need to have the expertise to be able to look at it in details. And sometimes you see a lot of uh, fibrin material in the VAD, especially in the outflow track, and you're not sure if it is infection or not. And if the patient is having positive blood cultures, this is where PET is going to become very handy to look at that. You're done? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you.